All right, and looks like everybody has their mute on except for Gail, which is perfect. So we will uh, we'll proceed with that. And uh, I want to I'm so sorry that I'm not there in person tonight to uh, to greet you, Gail, and to thank you for coming to speak to us. But um, I really wanted to hear your presentation, so I'm glad that we could could in a pinch do it this way instead. So um, there's never a good time to be under the weather. Fortunately, I'm on the road to recovery. My husband, unfortunately, got it after me, and he's he's not doing not feeling well. So uh, hopefully, I'll be better in a few days. But um, so tonight we have Dr. Gail Superbiel, who is a Baton Rouge-based birder, photographer, community college English professor, and a freelance writer and editor. Uh, her inspirational talk, Look Up, A Philosophy for Birding in Life, addresses what birding means to her and how it impacts her daily life. So I'm sure many of you will be able to relate to her experiences, and I will turn it over to Gail. Jane, could you let me um, share my screen, please? Yep. Did that do it? Yep. Okay. <clears throat> Perfect. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you all so very much for having me this evening. Um, I should preface this talk by saying I'm not a birding expert. I think y'all are probably much more expert than I am. I certainly not know a striker. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so if you're, and I'm also not a photography expert. So if you want to know about migration patterns of the vermilion flycatcher or what f stops to use, I, I'm, I'm not your, I'm not your girl. Um, but what I am, though, and how I think I can relate to y'all is I'm someone who's passionate about um, nature and birds and birding. And so I hope that I can convey that passion to you this evening. So tonight, um, I'd like to take you inside my birding journey, my birding life, tell you about that journey and um, about my philosophy, which is look up, which um, I think is so very appropriate both for birding and for life. So I want to talk to you first about my birding journey. So I've always been aware of birds as long as I can remember. Um, sometimes I think it's fascinating that there are so many birds around us everywhere and it seems like a lot of people are just unaware of them. Um, so in this first photo, um, I am um, with my twin brother. It's dated October of 1967, so we're two and a half. And you can see there in the foreground, I hope, um, there is a baby bird there, a fledgling, it's a robin. Um, and it's probably taking all of my willpower not to touch it. <laughs> um, and then my mom's taking the photo. And while, um, while she's taking the photo, I also have no doubt that she's also teaching us something, even at two and a half, because she was a teacher and she was a teacher even when she wasn't in the classroom. So there's no doubt in my mind that she's um, probably telling us that the baby bird's learning to fly. She, I'm sure she's telling us what kind it is and how she knows that. She's probably telling me not to touch it <laughs> um, and you know what it's gonna do next and that sort of thing. So in this, in this next photo, can I move this thingy out of the way? I want this to go, oh, here we go, all right. Um, in this next photo, um, my mom has written on the back, Milwaukee's View, summer 1971. So I'm six and I'm watching the geese. So of everything to see at the Milwaukee Zoo, here's Gail looking at Canada geese. <laughs> and so that's what's memorialized in the photo album. I'm not looking at lions or tigers or bears. I'm looking at geese. No, my, looking at geese. Um, and so uh, me, Looking at geese, probably no surprise to any of my friends. They, they would be completely unsurprised by this. 
So our family vacations were always camping trips, tent camping. Um, Colorado, Kentucky, Canada, um, Wisconsin. Oops, did it in advance? What's happening here? There we go. Oh. Um, so the photo on the left is Wisconsin in 1972. Um, and then the photo on the right is 1973, and that's at Mount Nebo, Arkansas, where some of you may have been before. So I always remember my mom and dad having a, a bird book or a plant book or a flower book. <clears throat> and for us, new discoveries were magical. Um, they were something to be celebrated. So I'll never forget, for example, um, the time that, <clears throat> excuse me, that we found a lady slipper orchid in Door County, Wisconsin. That was a super big deal in my family. We talked, we talked about it. My mom would still talk about it for, for years to come. Um, so something like this, or even a, a meadow lark on a fence post as we drove through the country, um, fritillary butterflies landing on our hands while we were camping or hummingbirds buzzing around our campground in Colorado. My parents both loved nature. And they sort of deeply instilled that love of nature into my, um, my brothers and me. I have a younger brother also. So I've had a lifelong interest in, in nature and, and birds in particular. Um, in my dreams, for as long as I can remember, um, if, I, if I encounter something dangerous, I'm able to fly away. And in that moment when flight begins, I feel wonderful and powerful and free and unafraid. So I've always had that experience. And likewise, I've always had an interest in photography. So we had a brownie box camera when we were kids. Um, it fascinated me, but I never learned anything really specific or, um, you know, I never took any classes or learned anything specific about photography. It was just something I was interested in. Um, I didn't really even have, have an eye for it back then. So you can see me here on the left trying to be a photographer. I've got my 1980s hairdo and my blue eyeliner, <laughs> um, my little point and shoot camera. And then there on the right, Brian took this photo of me fairly recently. So I have a better camera and hopefully better, <laughs> better hair than the 19, 1990s hair or 1980s hair. So in the early 2000s, I guess, I, I probably got what I would consider to be my first uh, iteration of a digital camera. I, I still didn't really know what I was doing, but I, I tried really hard. I've had a couple of friends, uh, Ken and Christy, who were both just wonderful photographers. Um, so they taught me about the rule of thirds and some other, you know, some other basic tips. And I started to understand composition a little bit better. But back then, birding for me was more incidental than intentional. So in other words, I'd be um, out doing something else. I'd be on a hike or something and I'd see a bird and then I'd go home and look it up in my bird book if I didn't know what it was. So after Brian and I were married, um, he bought me my first good camera and I began to sort of combine photography and birding in earnest. Um, and, you know, my parents had fed birds in the backyard. And then I did that too, as I, um, you know, moved out of the house and had my own places and, and so forth. But I get, began to think a little bit more about um, types of food and types of feeders and where I wanted to hang them and stuff like that. So then I began to specifically go out with the intention of looking for birds. So it kind of made this shift. So about six years ago, I had begun to hear about the, the Migratory Bird Festival at Grand Isle, which by the way, when I got there, was not quite what I thought a, fe a festival was gonna be. <laughs> It was a little different than I anticipated, but um, I convinced Brian to take me there for my birthday. So he's a lucky guy because my birthday's in April, so it's smack dab in the middle of um, spring migration. So now, um, henceforth, we'll uh, be going on what we now call Gail's big birthday birding adventures <laughs> in the spring. So he's a very good sport, and he's gotten to be a very good spotter. So he hauled me off to, to Grand Isle. So um, that was really my first encounter with a lot of migratory birds um, all in one place. Um, and I was, I was hooked. So, so many of the birds I saw during this outing were live birds. Um, I don't really keep a list, but I have all my, my photographs organized by bird names. So I guess that's my list sort of. So here's a few um, photos from that, that outing. 
something. And Rose Breasted Grosbeak I had seen before. I knew I knew what that was. So there's a story behind this next bird, which is the painted bunting. So, you know, I mean, I, I know y'all know that we consider this to sort of be the holy grail of birds here in, in North America. And it's just extraordinarily beautiful. So we were there on Grand Isle. We might have even seen Bob that year. Um, I didn't know who he was yet. Um, but we'd begun to hear this buzz around that people were seeking the painted bunting. And they, they were speaking in such reverent tones about it. Um, and so um, I was so incredibly excited and hopeful to see this bird, um, but it had a really special reason. Um, my mom had two birds that she always wanted to see before she died. One of them was a, um, a scissor tail flycatcher, um, which she did get to see um, in Missouri before she moved to Louisiana. And the other was a painted bunting, which she never got to see. So I had this immense pressure in my head about seeing this bird. I, I wanted to see it. I felt like I, I needed to see it for my mom. It was just so special and important. But then I thought, well, there's no way I'm going to see this bird, right? I want it too much. So it's not going to happen. You've all been there, right? So just as I had begun to give up hope, these grasses parted and, and there it was. And y'all, I was, I was overcome. Like I, st I started to cry. I could barely hold my camera. And I'm shaking about it now a little bit. Excuse me. Um, you know, there are other people around. Sure, they're like, why is this girl crying about the this bird? <laughs> Bren, Bren's looking at me like, baby, I mean, that's a pretty bird and all, but <laughs> real, right? <laughs> so it was just, um, you know, it was just this really magical moment for me. And I've been fortunate enough to see the painted bunting a number of times since then and to get much better photographs. Um, but yeah, but every time it's just as special as the first, um, maybe without the crying. <laughs> <laughs> so I began to get a little better at the photography part of things, got a better lens. Um, I started birding in earnest. Um, I joined the Louisiana Birds Facebook page and I lurked <laughs> for a really, really long time before I got brave enough to post anything. And then I started to get some encouragement from, um, from family and friends. And so I created a separate Instagram and Facebook pages just for photography. And um, I got a I started a photography website, started to sell a few prints here and there and stuff like that. And then I was I was birding in earnest. I was going on more birding adventures with Brian and, and by myself. <clears throat> so in April of 2019, um, on the Louisiana Birds Facebook page, Vicki Sensa, I'm sure if you're on there, you know who that is. Um, so she started posting about the, the fork-tailed flycatcher, which apparently is very rare to this part of the world. <clears throat> and so, of course, I got in the car and made a six-hour round trip to go see this bird, right? Didn't ever occur to me that I might get all the way down there and it might not be there, though, right? And, and fortunately, um, the, the flycatcher was there and I, I did get to see it. Um, so it was... That was kind of a turning point for me too, um, because I began to realize how important the birding community was. And I began to understand that we could all learn from each other and that we shared a common passion for birding and, and for birding photography in some cases. Um, Vicki wasn't there that day, but she made sure I had really specific directions so that I could find this bird. Um, and she was just as elated as I was that, that I had seen it. You know, somebody that she didn't know had met on the internet that wanted to go and see this bird. And then in the fall of the next year, I was just about to take my hummingbird feeders down um, when I saw a hummingbird land. <laughs> and so I was used to ruby-throated hummingbirds, of course, um, even though I knew there were other kinds, but this bird was, it was different. He had blue on it and a pinkish reddish bill so it was and it was a little bigger than a, a regular hummingbird so i knew immediately that it was something special and i started taking photos um 
and posting them on the Facebook burning page because I thought, okay, well, this seems to, seems to be kind of a big deal. And then before I knew it, I started getting all these messages on Facebook, <laughs> on the post and in Messenger. And all these people were asking me where my house was <laughs> and if they could come over to see this bird. So mind you, oh yeah, and then this one guy, Eric Johnson. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't know him from Adam. <laughs> okay, so mind you, this is October of the year of the pandemic that started in March, right? I didn't want to be around anybody. I did not want, I didn't want coming to our house for crying out loud. So I think I was a little terse with Eric when, <laughs> when he first started having a conversation. And, uh, you know, basically all I wanted to know is was he going to wear a mask when he came to my house? <laughs> so, which of course he did. So as it turns out, as many of you know, um, this is the hummingbird was a bird was a once in a year broad-billed hummingbird, um, and through its auspicious arrival at Sunshine House, which is what we call our house, um, I met some lovely people like Van Remsen, uh, thank you. Um, Jane, Colette Dean, you know, some 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 rock stars in the birding world down here, and so the bird was caught, of course. Eric being the whiz that he is, um, banded, weighed, measured, inspected. So I got to see every bit of it. It was just fascinating. Um, and then I got to turn the hummingbird loose with its new jewelry. So here's, here's me holding the hummingbird, you know, blowing on it to give it a lift and then just in absolute utter wonder. So, and then Colette wrote a story about the hummingbird for the advocate. It was on the front page of the lifestyle section. And so uh, my bird and I enjoyed a few days with minor local celebrity. <laughs> um, and then it flew off to another part of town. <laughs> I think it was tired of the paparazzi, I guess, um, and the limelight. But something I learned from that experience, um, which I, I should have learned from my um, jaunt to sulfur to see the fort tail flycatcher was that is that birders want other birders to to share their experiences um, to see that like bird for the first time um, to participate in citizen science and learn more about what birds do and where they go so I learned about eBird and reporting checklists of birds that I'd seen um, I learned that my backyard was and is a magical place so that winter. I saw six different species of hummingbirds in my backyard alone, and a seventh at, um, out here at Blue Bonnet Swamp. So then I faithfully upped the sugar content in my nectar. <laughs> so it would give the birds more energy in this winter and uh, be less likely to freeze. You can see this Deanna's here um, on our piece on our fountain. I immediately went out and started chipping away at the fountain. Um, and I bubble wrapped the hummingbird feeders. Um, and then I started to go on some more birding adventures. There's a few more birds from there. And just go and see and learn about so many beautiful birds. Some pretty yellows there. Such amazing prehistoric looking weird birds. Hello, Perulula. I love that one. So I, so I had moved into sort of serious birding territory at this point. Um, so what happened next is that I started to get some minor teasing among my friends. So I'm now the crazy bird lady. People give me t-shirts that say bird nerd. And when I go for a run with my friends, they can absolutely count on me saying, hey, you see those black bellied whistling ducks over there? You hear them whistle? Oh, look at that red-tailed fox. Or oh, that's, a, uh, that's a loggerhead shrike. He's also called the butcher bird and he does this. Um, and so then I start to get some messages from my friends. <laughs> this is a very, very small portion of the messages I get. Um, I just saw a small white bird with black rings in the oak tree. So I don't know what you're supposed to do with that. We had a lot, there were a lot of questions and photos exchanged before we figured that one out. Uh, is this a killdeer? What do we do for a bird who's just hanging out? Not sure if he hit the door. Um, how do you keep the blasted squirrels away from your bird feeders? So 
all of those kinds of questions. So as I mentioned, I'm not a birding expert. I can generally answer their questions okay. But some of them start to ask me um, how to be a birder or how to feed birds or how to be a birder. So I have to admit that when people ask me this question, um, I hope your answer is the same as mine, but I might be a little bit of a smart aleck. <laughs> <laughs> Outside, look at birds. So I mentioned at the beginning of this talk that my philosophy on burning the life is to look up, right? So um, fairly recently, I did just that myself. So um, I saw a life bird in my own front yard, this yellow-throated warbler. He was at the very top. We have a big oak tree right smack in the middle of our front yard. He was at the very top. So it's not a great picture, but it was a life bird. So I was super excited. So then I decided that I wanted to revamp our backyard to make it more bird bee butterfly friendly. So Brian was all in. So we've, we've always had a lot of bird traffic in our tiny backyard. Um, we've got a fountain and two bird baths and cover and feeders, you know, all the, all the right elements there. So um, I wanted to be more intentional about what we planted though. So we had, um, here, here and over there, we have just boring old leery oak beds. And so I uh, tore those out and we planted bat-faced graffia, salvia, fire spike, turk's cap, um, bee balm, zinnias, purple coneflowers, chrysandra, and we had so many bees and butterflies. Um, the hummingbirds love the caffia and the salvia. Right now I have a turk's cap that's like eight times the size of me and they're, they're heavy on that right now. Um, so it was such a great decision for our backyard visitors. Um, makes a great backdrop for photos too, which I'm, I'm fortunate about. Um, and this is right after we planted. So now everything's just, just enormous. Can I ask you what part of town? Mid city. Yeah. So here's some of our backyard visitors. I love, that little, yeah, love that little yellow warbler photo. He's all proud. There's some of the butterflies we've had. And some of this year's hummingbirds on the salvia. Little guy. So in addition to birds being beautiful to look at and, and listen to you, I've really found that it has such a wonderful impact on both spirituality and mental health. So I spent the entire pandemic working from my backyard. Our patio became my office. And so I had a heater and a heat pad and a blanket in the dead of winter, a fan in the dead of summer. Um, and it was one of the richest and most rewarding experiences of my life. I really got to be really in tune with our backyard and the comings and goings of everybody. Um, and this was despite the absolute turmoil that was going on in the world um, and more personal stress than I could ever imagine. So I lost my dad suddenly and unexpectedly during that time. Um, I finished my doctoral coursework, wrote my comps, passed my oral exams, uh, wrote and defended my dissertation had a really stressful situation at work I was dealing with. And so now that we've left our virtual world and gone back to um, brick, brick and mortar, I'm still fortunate to be able to do a lot of my work from home. And I, I return to the yard whenever I can. I'm, I'm out there all the time. If I need to take a mental health break, then I'll go to the woods or a park or the lakes and, um, and, and just go there in the stillness of, of being and breathing and mindfulness just returns me to center. Um, I find birding and being outdoors to be spiritual to you, a link to God or mother nature or whatever um, form your, your religion takes you. Um, my photographs take me back to the moment when I captured um, that image of that bird, a new bird or one that I'd seen before. And then I can relive that experience even if I can't make the time to go and, and have a, a new one, I guess. I've met so many wonderful people in the birding community. Um, like the folks I mentioned earlier, new friends that I've uh, tagged along with on birding adventures, um, shared road trips and stories and, and that sort of thing, like birds. 
Um, Bernie's taught me that 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 humor is everywhere. Um, I think there's very little funnier than a head-on shot of an osprey or an upside-down snowy egret or a blue jay just taking a bath. I love this osprey. That was our grand isle <laughs> cracks me up. Um, Birding's taught me that it's okay to take chances, um, like the fork-tailed flycatcher I mentioned earlier, or uh, Lynn and Bob and I hopped in the car and drove to Grand Isle to see if we could find the, the red-legged honey creepers, which I was so very glad that we got to see. That was a really amazing experience. Birding has taught me patience. Um, so I waited and waited and waited and waited to get a good picture of the kingfisher. Um, you know, notoriously shy and skittish, and um, they've thwarted me every single time. Um, during that trip to Grand Isle, they were everywhere. We saw a dozen of them probably right along the road, and I could not get a picture. Um, so I went to Lake Erie on the LSU Lakes, and I, I just waited and watched for uh, probably an hour, and said, finally, I finally got him. Um, and then the same thing with the uh, the ruby crown kinglet. So um, of all the kinglets I've ever seen, I've only seen a crown once and it was like up and back down. And um, I think maybe I got a shot of a tiny red stripe down the top of his head. Um, but a few days ago, I was watching a kinglet in our backyard. I saw a little hint of red. So I just kept watching him. And so we have jasmine on both sides of the fence um, uh, in our yard. And all the birds like to get in there and hang out and um, eat bugs and what have you. And so he was just kind of weaving through the jasmine and then he just stopped and he started preening and the crown popped up and it just stayed that way. And I was, I, and I, I could give you, I don't know, 50 photos <laughs> of this little guy with his crown up, but uh, that was really, so really a great moment. So that really taught me um, patience. Um, birds have also brought me great comfort as well. Although a few years ago, I would have said that was utter nonsense. So about six months before my mom died, um, the mom of a friend from work passed away. And then he would tell me that he was seeing signs of his mom. And it was stuff like a little pile of rocks perfectly aligned, stuff like that. And I've known for a long time that people think that a cardinal is a sign of a loved one in heaven. Um, my beloved mother-in-law, Brian's mom, um, she believes that, and she has a cardinal that comes to visit her every single day. He comes to her art studio, and he's outside the window. He comes every day, and she believes it's a sign um, from heaven of her dad. So I've always sort of disregarded that kind of talk. Um, my practical nature says it's just being window aggressive. He thinks there's another bird, um, but I'm not going to tell anybody else that, right? <laughs> Um, you know, I thought it was nice that other people believed that, but I was heavily skeptical. So then after my mom died, um, I found a letter in her strong box where she described three eagle sightings that she called eagle messages. Um, and I'd never known her to, to think of or believe in this sort of thing. Um, but she believed these were signs from my stepdad, Gene, after his death. Both were heavily involved in scouting. Um, my stepdad was the camp ranger of a Boy Scout camp, um, Camp Thunderbird. His Indian scouting name was Keeper of the Bird, and my mom's Indian scouting name was Watcher of the Bird. So I had this kind of in my head, but I still had my healthy, my healthy dose of skepticism. So then um, a series of events happened. So my mom died in October of um, 2016. And for Christmas that year, my stepmom, Denise, sent me a package. And one of the things in the package was a small um, bird ornament made out of porcelain, and it was a tufted titmouse. And so there was a letter in with the um, in with the ornament, and it said that many years ago, after um, my dad and step um, mom were married, my mom had sent her this bird, this ornament, saying that every Christmas tree needs a bird. And my stepmom thought it would bring me comfort, um, having just lost my mom, so she sent it to me. And here's the kicker. I never knew about the ornament. I, I didn't know my mom had done that. There was no way that my mom could have known 40 some years ago, and no way that my stepmom could have known 40 some years later 
that this is my favorite bird. Mm -hmm. So here it is, Christmas of 2016, right after my mom dies and I have this tufted titmouse ornament, this mm -hmm. me meaningful thing. So in Christmas, so that was Christmas 2016, then a week later we moved into our house and started feeding birds. We had all the usual suspects, you know, blue jays and cardinals and what have you, house finches. Um, and then all of a sudden the, the tufted titmouse appeared. Well, this was Mother's Day of the next year, the first time I'd seen it. Um, and I, I didn't see him again for a while. And then Brian was out of town and um, I was home alone. And then I texted him, I said, Tufty came to the backyard again today and I got a picture. God was looking out for me while you're away. So needless to say, it sort of made me start to rethink my position a little bit um, about birds as totems, you know, wondering whether we get signs from heaven or whether we just turn something into whatever we happen to need at that particular time in our lives. There's more of the story though. So in May of 2020, I'm gonna try not to cry when I tell you this part, um, my dad, who was as healthy as a horse, fit as could be, exercised um, every single day, thought he would be hundred years old, um, was diagnosed with leukemia and he died 18 days after his diagnosis. So it was an immense and terrible and unexpected time, as you can imagine. Um, my dad lived in Northern Michigan, he was a youper um, on an island, which we'll call an island loosely because it was just it was not quite touching the land and you just drove you know, over this little bridge to get to the actual land. And so this is a day or two after he had died. So I was driving off the island and it was raining and it was May, but it was freezing cold. It's just a miserable, miserable day. And it matched my mood perfectly, as you can imagine. Um, and so I'm turning onto the road that takes you off the island and all of a sudden an owl lands in a branch directly in front of me above my car, like right here. Mm -hmm. um, now I've, I've heard owls plenty of times, I've heard them out here plenty of times, but I had never seen one. Um, and so suddenly right there in broad daylight, albeit rainy, um, in front of my car, there's there's this barn owl. And so I got out of my car and I used my phone camera and I got some pictures. And then the photographer <laughs> started to kick in. I was like, Ooh, I wish I had my good camera. And so I thought, well, maybe I can just run back to dad and get my big camera and maybe he'll be there. And so I got back in the car and I mad dashed back to my dad's and came back with my camera and he was he was still there. So I just stood there in the rain and, and, and took pictures of him. And I can't really tell you how that how that made me feel, you know, to, to see that owl. So um, you know, again, maybe we use what we need to make us feel the way we need to feel um, possible. Maybe there's something more to it. Um, but since then, I've seen the barred owl, owl several more times. Um, and let's just say I'm less inclined to disbelieve in the presence of certain birds at certain times in your life. Let's just say that. So as I approach another decade of life <laughs> in a few years, I think about what my legacy might be. We don't, we don't have children. Um, I haven't written a book. I'm not a, I haven't written a brilliant birding book. Um, or endowed a building or anything, anything fun like that. Um, so sometimes I like to think that what I'm going to leave behind is my passion for birding, some pretty photographs. Um, maybe I've inspired someone to start their own birding journey. Um, there's a little boy that I know of who purchased some of my prints with his own money um, in a school fundraising auction. So when a friend texts to ask me what kind of bird is this, I wonder if maybe I've sparked a little interest in them that maybe they'll pass along to their children. So I, I feel like kind of in a way that sharing these things that my parents instilled in me, this love and appreciation of nature, um, is a way for me to pass along a little bit of myself and, and of them. Um, and there's, there's so much beauty around us if we just look for it, if we just look up. Um, and maybe one of my photos can bring a bit of nature inside to someone and they can see it and be happy and inspired and be reminded to look for that beauty around them. Thank you very much for having me.
I'm like, that's all scary. <laughs> I guess that if anybody, does anybody have a question? Hopefully not. <laughs> What's your last name, please? Super Bill. Super Bill. Super Bill. Uh -huh. I tell my students it's like super pill, but with bees. <laughs> That helps them to remember. I imagine we can see some of your photos on the website. Yes. Yeah. Can we go back to the credit? Oh, sure. Sorry. Sorry, Jane. Hang on one second. Sure. What kind of camera do you use? Um, I have a Nikon D5300 with a 200-500 lens. So it helps keep my arms strong. <laughs> It weighs like eight pounds or something crazy. So. Thank you all so much for having me. Thank you, Gail. Does it, anybody in the room have questions or anybody online have questions for Gail? I do want to say something. Gail showed you a picture of her yard. And of course, the way that the, the photograph works, it sort of um, uh, increases the perspective of it. Her yard is tiny, y'all. It's mm -hmm. tiny. I went there to see that broad-billed hummingbird, and and I was just amazed because uh, she's in a wonderful part of town. Um, being, you know, that mid-city area has lots of live oak cover, which does definitely hold bring in birds and hold birds. But um, but her yard is tiny, so. If there's no other lesson, of course, she she gave many inspirational points, but there's no other lesson um, to take away today. It's that you can use whatever space you have to bring nature to you um, with the addition of water, with the addition of plants um, and the fact that she has been consistently and persistently paying attention, because um, I think that is is absolutely key as well. So um, the birds are there, you know, it's just, uh, it's up to us to, to pay attention to them. So I, I would add to that, that um, because I keep all my birding photos in, uh, in folders on my computer, I can go back and see, oh, that Junko was here at almost exactly the same time last year and the year before and the year before. Yeah. So that's, that's been really cool too. Yeah. You did during the ice storm. Yes. So maybe that was your house. You well, you came I'm, to I'm after University Hill. Yes. Okay. But yeah. I was like you. I went into my front room. We have a lot of picture window, a lot of big windows. Mm -hmm. And I went into my front room to let the shades down, and I noticed this, you know, jewel flying <laughs> yeah. around my my uh, bottle brush, bottle brush, and I was like, that is not. The regular deal, mm -hmm. and then um, you know it's landed in my Parson Hawthorne that I have outside my sunroom, and I uh, I posted on eBird, and someone immediately came back and said, "You're going to have to put a picture." It was it was he had been banded right I by then? See the band. Yeah, so I, I did not notice that. But, yeah, um, yeah, they they confirmed it. I was saying, oh, you know, Fred Fred Shelton, who is a professor at LSU, and in ornithology. Mm -hmm. So, um, but of course, I thought whoever was responded to me knew who Fred was. You know, it's down at Fred's house too. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, yeah, I think yeah. You, I think you're where he it went after. Amazing. He yeah. stayed for about a day after the banding, and then uh, he was like, mm, nah. <laughs> I mean, Well, no, I didn't see the band. He might have been in my house first. Yeah, but he, his little legs froze to my my um uh, feeder oh my gosh and so i had to go out there and um you know but before i i got him off he managed to to or she i, don't, I guess it was you no yeah. man yeah but anyway yeah he fell back cool. yeah. you know, <laughs> his little legs were still stuck on them well anyway yeah i know i it never fails to amaze me when I tell people stories about the banded hummingbirds um, in my yard. You know, the hummingbird, the rufous hummingbird that was banded in my yard in January of 21, right before that polar vortex, made it through that, went to the Pacific Northwest and made it back to my yard in the fall of that same year. It's just, 
it's truly a miracle that these birds yeah, can do amazing. what they do. They're amazing creatures. They're amazing creatures. Sure. They are amazing creatures so. All right, anybody else? Comments or questions? Do you do your own landscaping? Pardon? Do you do your own landscaping? Um, we did a lot of it. Um, we originally had the house landscaped when we, we built our house. So we had some landscaping done, but um, like putting in those beds and stuff, we did we did all that. Um, we've done some of the rock roll. Brian's done some of the rock work and stuff, but um, we had we had part of it landscaped, and then we've come and done stuff ourselves too. But that, all that stuff, the pollinator beds, we did that. Yeah. All right, y'all. Well, we'll wrap up tonight. And uh, again, I'm so sorry I couldn't be there. I'm glad that everybody got together. How many people are there at Blue Bonnet Swamp? It's 30. It's okay, good. Good. Well, that's a good turnout. That's about what I expected. So I'm glad that y'all got to, to have that camaraderie, even if I didn't. And uh, everybody, please have a happy and safe holiday. Stay healthy. And uh, we'll see you hopefully around the Christmas bird count. We'll do another Zoom after the count to see where we are and then uh, meet again in January. So thanks again. Thank All right. Thank you. Night, y'all.